A senior Ukrainian official says that Russian forces are digging in and preparing to defend the partially occupied southern region of Kherson. Ukrainian troops have been forcing back the Russians and retaking land in the region for weeks. Now they are threatening to trap Russian forces on the west bank of the Dnipro River. Kremlin-backed authorities have been moving civilians to further east locations ahead of the lo Ukrainian advance. But an advisor to President Zelensky says that Moscow is strengthening its front line and not preparing a retreat from Kherson. Earlier, I spoke with DW correspondent Fanny Fachar in Kyiv, who is following the latest developments in the region, where Russian troops are said to be preparing to hold the line against the counteroffensive from Ukraine. Have a listen. Not only to hold the line, Sarah, but they are attempts to actually break, to break through those Ukrainian positions as well which clearly tells you or indicates that Russia doesn't only want to be on the defensive, but actually make it or slow down the Ukrainian counteroffensive there. And if you look at Kherson city, why it is so important strategically, why is it that fierce battle is expected over the uh, control of the city? We have to understand that it's been occupied by Russian forces from early March. Uh, so quite pretty much at the beginning of this full-scale invasion, a lot of questions actually have uh, been proposed uh, to uh, the Ukrainian government by various people why that was possible to take Kherson city from early on. That's something to be answered, obviously, once once this war is over, right now the focus is for Ukrainian forces how to liberate Kherson city. And obviously if that's going to happen, then they do have this very important land corridor established again towards Crimea with their next quest then, which would be to also take on Crimea. Something that Russia is not just going to simply let go of. There is a fierce battle ex uh, expected over Kherson city and over the control of this very important regional capital of the region. Tell us a little bit more about the Ukrainian counteroffensive, just more broadly speaking, funny, because I mean, the Ukrainians, they have had the momentum in recent weeks. Certainly, just over the past couple of weeks, they have been able to liberate about 90 settlements, at least. That's the uh, information we receive here from the Ukrainian government. 90 settlements. This is on the western part of the Dnipro River, because the way you have to imagine here, Harrison region, it is being basically separated through the Dnipro River. So you have one part of the region on the western bank, the other part on the eastern bank. And to the eastern bank, this is where the Russian forces actually moved thousands of uh, Ukrainians to expecting this uh, battle to, uh, oh, to, to, to uh, intensify, of course, in the next uh, couple of days. Now, uh, the fact that Ukraine is speaking about 90 settlements, of course, we cannot verify these numbers. We cannot even tell you exactly what's happening in Kherson city right now, simply because it is not possible for international or even for local journalists to access Russian occupied territory or in just a very limited way, even is it possible to access the Ukrainian controlled part of Harrison region. So everything that we can say at this point that the battle over that important region and per se of that capital of Harrison region, Harrison city namely, is going to uh, take up quite uh, some steam in a couple of days. And the question will be who is going to actually uh, take control over Harrison city. Well, of course, tens of thousands of civilians there are bearing the brunt of this fighting from both sides, Ukrainian on one and Russian on the other side. Fanny Fachar in Kyiv, thank you so much. And as winter approaches, soldiers in Ukraine won't just be battling the Russian military, they will also be battling the elements. Along the front line trenches in eastern Ukraine, preparations are underway with NATO supplied sleeping bags, fresh chopped firewood, and even a do-it-yourself sauna to beat winter's chill. Weapons and ammunition are crucial if the Ukrainian military hopes to continue retaking ground seized by Russia. But these soldiers in eastern Ukraine's Donetsk region know that being prepared for freezing temperatures will also be key to their survival in the coming months. From sleeping bags to socks, to trenches. They aren't just bracing for battle, they're bracing for the cold. Winter in the Donbass is hell. It's a steppe climate with freezing nights, temperatures down to minus 30 degrees Celsius. 
I felt it in 2014. It's hell. There are no forests, regular winds and very low temperatures. This trench is just 700 metres from Russian positions. But life goes on for the soldiers of the 5th Assault Brigade. One metre underground, they wash, eat and sleep by a wood fire stove. There's also a sauna, built using a tutorial they found on the internet. It took us three days to build the sauna. First we dug the ditch, then we covered it with a special membrane and bags for it to sustain at least minimal mortar fire. It won't survive a direct hit, but we think it could survive an explosion from 82 caliber fire. In nearby Kharkiv, close to the Russian border, preparing for combat and the cold go hand in hand for this Ukrainian National Guard unit. The logs will be used in a wood-burning stove in a trench several meters down. There's already ground frost outside, inside a functional kitchen and sleeping quarters. This modular capsule is a few meters below ground level. There's lots of soil above and soil on the right. Basically it's a very warm space. It's also very safe provides good protection in case of explosions, and at the same time it protects us from cold. By planning ahead, Ukraine's soldiers want to make sure the winter is one battle they're prepared for. And at a conference here in Berlin, delegates from the world's leading economies have vowed to fund the massive reconstruction that will be needed in Ukraine after the war. The conference host, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, said that the ground had been laid for a comprehensive plan to rebuild. The war is far from over, but the international community is already preparing the ground for reconstruction. Hosting the conference in Berlin, Chancellor Scholz said now is the time to decide how to rebuild and how to pay for it. What is at stake here? Nothing less than creating a new Marshall Plan for the 21st century a generational task that must begin now. The recovery, reconstruction and modernization of Ukraine will indeed be a challenge for generations, one that will require the combined strength of the entire international community. The recent attacks on Ukraine have marked a new low in this war. This was Mykolaiv, southern Ukraine, on Monday. A playground and residential neighborhood reduced to rubble by Russian attacks. There's also been heavy damage to the power supply in Lviv, to buildings and streets in Kiev, and to civilian targets like this shopping center in Zaporizhia. Joining the Berlin conference by video link, President Zelensky said billions would also be needed to balance the state budget in the coming year. Ukraine's Prime Minister Denis Shmihal said his country needs between 3 and 5 billion euros a month just to keep going. But he told the conference why international help makes sense. We need this money to recover infrastructure immediately, uh, to help us survive this winter, to save the people from humanitarian catastrophe and to save the European continent from the migration wave, from the immigration tsunami. According to the World Bank, the total bill for damage to Ukraine's infrastructure will be $350 billion. The Ukrainian government says it could be much more. Some worry about a lack of transparency when such amounts are discussed. But EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen is taking a positive view. Reconstruction linked with a dynamic EU accession process can function as a catalyst, as it was said today here for necessary reforms, and at the same time, and this is certainly true, as a strong motivator to implement these reforms, because there's a goal you want to go to, and therefore you understand why you have to do these reforms. The EU will support Ukraine for as long as necessary, von der Leyen said, help likely to be worth billions every month. It is clear that the human cost of the war in Ukraine is immense. The financial cost is also huge. And let's bring in DW correspondent Manuel Chaz, who has been following the conference for us. Emanuela, tell us a little bit more about the outcome and whether or not it's achieved its aims. 
what we have to keep in mind, Sarah, is that this is not a donors conference, so there hasn't been any uh, commitment, any financial commitment, any further commitment than those that were already made in previous conferences. Yesterday's conference was very much about, uh, you know, uh, setting up a framework, even if a timeline wasn't defined, setting up this framework with experts, with uh, decision makers, with the IMF, also with uh, European uh, decision makers, with businesses to see just how this recovery uh, can get started even before uh, the war uh, ends uh, in Ukraine. This is why it was very important and it's also something that uh, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz compared to Germany's own recovery post-World War II with the Marshall Plan. So it's very much drawing uh, on uh, history, on uh, past uh, experiences and uh, with the hope that uh, the construction will start as soon as possible in Ukraine. And the theme was uh, about Ukraine with Ukraine. Walk us through just how much of a say Kyiv indeed is having in talks about the course of its own future. Well, Ukrainian authorities were very much present. There was an address of Volodymyr Zelensky, the Ukrainian president, although he said that even if a lot of money had been pledged for Ukraine's recovery, uh, he also uh, highlighted the fact that so far uh, Ukraine hasn't seen a cent uh, of those uh, pledges when it comes to recovery. Uh, however, uh, there were also civilian uh, uh, actors uh, who were present, who had their own project to rebuild their country. They were here yesterday at the conference. Some of them told me they felt a little bit frustrated because they felt uh, there wasn't much room to discuss concrete initiatives. However, the Chancellor also said that experts learned a lot by talking to people who are on the ground and the hope is that with, within the framework being uh, created, there's going to be uh, concrete uh, measures, con concrete actions uh, being uh, being put in place in the coming weeks, in the coming months, even if though, even though uh, like I said, we don't have a precise time time frame yet. Emanuela Chaz in Berlin. Thank you.